And once again, folks, please remember to wear your mask above your nose at all times while we're in the planetarium. Thank you so much, y'all. We do appreciate it. And once again, for the folks who are just stepping inside the Morrison Planetarium, welcome, welcome, y'all. We're going to get started with the last Planetarium show in just about four more minutes or so. We're going to see if any other folks can come on in and join us. And uh, just a heads up, y'all.
All righty, everybody. It looks like I got the okay to start our planetarium show. So I'm going to put away our space trivia questions and that important message because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. <gasps> Whoa. <laughs> and uh, once again, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I'm going to be your planetarium presenter. And just a heads up, I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person and I'm standing right behind you. Hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> Don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. Everything that you see in purple is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout the planetarium dome. If you're looking for those projectors, we got two in the front, two in the middle, and two at the very top, just below that purple glow. And I just want to let you know that I'm here. I'm going to be your space pilot, in a sense. And uh, just to let you know, the show that we're going to be doing right now is different from all the other previous shows that we've done here in the planetarium. This show is called Tour of the Universe, and it's absolutely my favorite to do because I'm going to be talking for the next 30 minutes, and we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth, and we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. Hopefully, by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space, but just to let you know, we are very, very small in the grand, grand scheme of things, so just to let you won't know. And uh, before we get started, folks, I do have to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We can have a great experience in the planetarium. There's a few of us in here right now. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside. If you manage to bring any snacks or beverages, make sure those are tucked away to the very end of the show. We want to keep the theater nice and clean for, for all of our future guests. This also does include no feetsies on the seatsies because, again, we want to make sure the seats stay nice and clean. So make sure the feet are on the floor and not on the seats. We do appreciate your help, y'all. And also, folks, if you happen to have any fancy 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces bright white light or loud sound, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put them away for the next 30 minutes, as these can be very distracting not only for yourself, but for the folks sitting behind you. So we want to be courteous to everyone in the planetarium dome. Ooh, and also the biggest of them all, folks, please remember to wear your mask at all times while we're in the planetarium dome above the nose. People tend to forget that we breathe out of our nostrils, so we want to make sure those nostrils are covered up. It looks like there's roughly about 100 of us here in the planetarium right now, so we're going to be in here for 30 minutes. So again, please wear your mask. Can't stress that enough, y'all. Thank you. And also, folks, if you do need to exit the planetarium for any reason, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit at the very top of the planetarium. That's where the exits will be before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. And last but not least, folks, this show is very immersive thanks to our 70-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, you may even feel a little bit scared. That's totally normal. There's a really quick and easy way to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, and your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling through space, at least not more than the usual. <laughs> but with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go. I'm just going to wait for those last couple of cell phones to get put away, and then we'll begin our tour of the universe. All right, folks, looks like all phones are away, so let's get started. I invite y'all to sit back, relax, and let's get the show started. All righty, everybody. As I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to home, although this is doesn't really look like San Francisco. Okay, maybe downtown San Francisco, but we can see the Earth just down below us right over here at this big sphere. So that's the Earth, and we're going to be starting off at this really cool contraption known as the International Space Station. Uh, we also like to shorten it by calling it the ISS, and a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, what's the International Space Station? I always hear about it in the news and articles, but I don't know what exactly it is. Well, just to let you know, folks, the ISS is a research facility, a laboratory that's orbiting around our planet Earth. And this came to be because there was a bunch of nations across planet Earth that wanted to figure out what happens to things in space. So again, a bunch of nations came together and they created this amazing thing where they can test out all different types of experiments that they can't do on Earth normally. And some of the science experiments that they'll conduct up here are things like uh, what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Do the plants grow the same with less gravity? Do they grow uh, similarly? 
Uh, what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does that act differently? And one of my favorites is that they had two identical twins. One twin lived on Earth for about a year. The other one lived on the International Space Station for a year. After that year, they compare and contrasted. Turns out when you live in space uh, for a good amount of time, you tend to uh, age a little bit slower. And not only that, you also lose a lot of body mass index. That means you lose a lot of muscle because you don't have gravity constantly working down on your, on your body. So if you're planning to live in space for a long period of time, make sure to exercise every day. Key. And uh, right now, the International Space Station looks incredibly large on our screen, folks, but it's not that big in actuality. It's only about the size of an American football field. So if you've never been to an American football game, uh, you can also use the entire California Academy of Sciences, the museum that we're sitting in right now. And what's also really neat is that this thing is going incredibly fast, folks. Uh, the International Space Station is traveling at a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. And it's also not too far away from the Earth. It looks incredibly far away, but it's only about 225 miles above the surface of our planet Earth. 225 miles, that's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. And just to let you know, folks, this is as far as we put humans out into space nowadays, uh, only 225 miles above the surface of our Earth, because getting out here in space gets really expensive. First, you had to find yourself a rocket ship or build yourself a rocket ship. And then you had to account for all the rocket fuel. And you're going to need a lot, a lot of rocket fuel. And I mean a lot. And once you get all your get your hands on that fuel, then you also have to account for all the food, all the water, all the air you're going to be breathing while you're out here in space. So the bill starts to get quite costly quite rapidly. But folks, the International Space Station is just the first stop on our tour of the universe. So let's leave that behind. And now we're going to see it slowly disappear compared to our planet Earth. Before we lose track of the International Space Station, I want to add a nice little orbital path so we can keep track of it. And let's see it slowly fade away. And as we're getting a much larger view of our world, I do want to let you know, folks, that the space program that I'm using here in the planetarium is something that you can go home and download, and you can fly through space just like how I am. The space program that I'm using here is something called Open Space Project. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project, uh, you'll come across the website where you can download it. But just a heads up, Open Space is in its beta phase, which means that it's not completely finished. So we may come across a few bugs and glitches here and there. If we do, I will point them out for you but hopefully we can look past them. And also folks, uh, open space uses a whole lot of processing power because it uses a lot of uh, information. So if you have an older computer, I wouldn't recommend it. If you have a newer one or a gaming computer, give it a try, it's a whole lot of fun. And if you're a person like me that doesn't like to download stuff, we also have another great option called NASA's Eyes. Just kind of like the human eyeballs, type in your favorite search engine, NASA's Eyes, and you can fly through space just like how I am. And it's a whole lot of fun. But now that we got a few options of different space programs, let's head over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Now, just to let you know, folks, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was quite a while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972. Thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions, that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. They got to conduct science. And of course, they got to play golf up here as well. So they had fun. And luckily, we are inside a planetarium, so let me turn off the nighttime of the moon. Hey, that looks much more familiar. But again, last time we humans went to the moon was 1972, a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, we humans are planning to go back to the moon uh, relatively soon in the next few years, thanks to NASA's new space mission called Artemis. Now, that's pretty funny to say because Artemis is the sister to Apollo in Greek mythology. NASA is very clever at coming up with these space names. But what's the whole purpose of Artemis? Well, NASA wants to send humans to Mars, but before we send humans deep into our solar system, we need to figure out how exactly we're gonna live out here in space. So the moon is a perfect stepping stone to send humans to figure out all those logistics. And what's also really neat is that uh, NASA's not only gonna be, NASA's gonna be sending the first woman to the moon on that Artemis trip, but not only that, they're also gonna be sending the first person of color to the moon, 
But not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases throughout the moon. So in the past 50 years, our technology has improved a whole lot, and we're able to con do different things uh, that we wouldn't normally ha have been able to 50 years ago. So maybe we want to set up a lunar base right over here at Copernicus Crater, one of the larger craters on the moon. Maybe we'll study some of those soil samples there. Maybe we want to go set up uh, over here on the lava tubes. We'll take a look at that. Or maybe we want to go look at the really high land, the mountain areas, all the way towards the top. Maybe we want to take a look at those. But what's also really neat is that with Artemis, they're going to have a space station that's going to be orbiting around the moon at all times, kind of like with the International Space Station, how we just saw. So if anything was to go wrong while these astronauts were on the moon, they can launch off the surface of the moon and head to that space station where they would be safe. So again, we humans should be heading back to the moon in the next few years. Look out for any news about Artemis. So really cool stuff. And folks, uh, when we look up at the moon here on Earth, the moon looks incredibly close to us sometimes, especially when it's close to the horizon. But the moon is incredibly far away from us, y'all. It's roughly about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, 240,000 miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop, going about 80 miles per hour or so. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. Hee hee hee. <laughs> and uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. And light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it's time for us to leave the moon behind. So everybody uh, say bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And now, folks, we're going to start to slowly see the Earth and the moon and they, as they slowly recede. In fact, let me turn on the planet trail so we don't lose track of them. You can easily lose stuff out here in space. And now we're going to see them slowly disappear. And on our journey, folks, we're going, to be, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to the help of computer models like open space showing us the most accurate information available to us. And now the nearest star to us, the sun, comes into view. Do, 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 do. And uh, the sun's really far away from us as well. So we're the third rock from the sun. So we just left Earth. That's us over there on the right-hand side. That's the sun. The distance between us is about 93 million miles. Ooh, that's pretty far away. But in terms of light speed, that's not far at all. And in order for light to travel that 93 million miles, it only takes light about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light to cross that distance. So not long at all. But what's really cool is that if the sun was to turn off all of a sudden, no more sunlight was being emitted, that last bit of sunlight would travel that 93 million miles, travel, uh, travel for eight and a half minutes at the speed of light. And that last bit of sunlight would reach us here on Earth. And then all of a sudden, the daytime would become nighttime. Now, that's a really cool concept because that works for really far away objects in space as well. For example, let's say we're looking at a star, let's say this one in the background, that's 70 light years away from us. Well, we're looking at that star as it looked like 70 years ago because that light that just reached us travels 70 years to get to us. So when we're looking at really far away objects out in space, it's kind of like looking back in time in a sense. Pretty cool. But now that we have a nice bird's eye perspective of our solar system, let's get a refresher of what's inside of our solar system, shall we? So right in the middle, we have our star, the sun. The closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, that's us. And then we have Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places where we can actually land a spacecraft on. And then beyond the orbit of Mars, we have this really cool thing called the main asteroid belt. And this is what it would look like if it would highlight all the asteroids in the asteroid belt. Now, what's really neat is that the asteroid belt was discovered in the early 1800s by a European space organization that called themselves the Celestial Police, which kind of sounds like something out of Doctor Who, in my opinion. <laughs> and then past our asteroid belt, we have the big planets, the gas giants, the Jovians. We've got Jupiter, then we have Saturn, 
And then past them, we have our large icy gas giants. We got Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can always add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet. So here's the orbit of Pluto at the very top left. And a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, why did Pluto get kicked out of the Planet Club? I learned about Pluto as a planet in, in school. I still think of it as a planet. I love Pluto. Viva love Pluto. Well, you see, folks, Pluto hangs out here in this outer part of our solar system past the orbit of Neptune called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, the Kuiper Belt's going to be all this stuff. So you can kind of think of the Kuiper Belt as a second asteroid belt past the orbit of Neptune. Out here, you're going to find icy asteroids and uh, short period comets, comets that don't stray too far away from the sun. They have nice short periods. Now, in 2006, a lot of astronomers came across a lot of these objects, more than 400 objects out here in the Kuiper Belt region. And we couldn't call all this stuff planets. There was just way too many of them, and they were of various sizes. So all the astronomers came across planet Earth and had a great big meeting. They had to figure out what exactly you need to be to be considered a planet. And one of the criteria is that you need to be so big and so massive that you push all the other objects out of your orbital path. Unfortunately for Pluto, it didn't pass that uh, criteria, that test, because it kind of dances around its own moon and kind of gets pushed around by other objects. So that's why Pluto got kicked out of the Planet Club and is now considered a dwarf planet. But don't worry, there's quite a few dwarf planets out here in the Kuiper Belt region. We've got Make, Make, Haumea, and Aries, just to name a few. And of course, we have Ceres in the main asteroid belt, more, much more closer to home. But I'm going to put away the Kuiper Belt because that's just a whole lot to look at. And now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen some of the many different spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. There we go. So on screen, we have the trajectories of Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. We can see that interaction at the very top left right over there. Thanks to that flyby, we were able to get some amazing high-definition images of Pluto that we didn't have uh, before. Now, all of these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind, but even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not yet traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for light to travel all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, it takes a light about five hours at the speed of light to get this far, so only five hours. But folks, let's leave our planetary system scale behind because now we're going to be heading out into interstellar space. Uh, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. So again, our star system's right in the middle. And I just want to make sure we've got the right star system. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be that one right there. So the star system that's right above us, that's moving a lot right here, that's Alpha Centauri. We're right in the middle. So again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. But four years at the speed of light doesn't really put in perspective of how far away that is. Well, if you're getting a rocket ship of today and left our planet Earth, it's going to take you about 8,500 years just to cross that distance. And that's just a one-way trip. Whew, I don't want to take that trip. <laughs> but folks, let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we're going to be heading inside something called the radiosphere. So again, folks, we are now inside the radio sphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. And this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light. So this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year. So is anybody out there listening? And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen uh, these markers. These markers represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planet orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. 
So far to date, we found 5,000 exoplanets. That was just announced a couple of weeks ago. So 5,000 exoplanets in the last 30 years. That's when we first began our search for exoplanets. So we humans have come across a long way. And that 5,000 number of exoplanets is going to be constantly growing because we have space telescopes where their whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. They're constantly scanning the night sky. And if we find, look in the right direction, we can see a whole heap of exoplanets just in one direction. There it is at the very bottom of the screen. We pointed our space telescopes in that one direction and we found a whole heap of exoplanets. So that 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years continue. But to answer the question, if any of them are suitable for life as we know it, well, we can't answer that question quite yet. Pretty much new space telescopes are being developed right now in order for us to answer that question. So it's going to be a few years before we can tackle that one. But the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in this star system inside our radio sphere. Let's say over here on the left-hand side, we find an alien civilization 60 years away from us over here. We shoot them a text message. We say, hi, we're over here. Take 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back another 60 years. That is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew, and I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. But of course, folks, planetary systems beyond our radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet. But eventually they will, as it's constantly uh, growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, folks, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers, but I'm going to leave our radio sphere up on screen. As huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to the Milky Way galaxy. So keep your eyes on that radio sphere as we continue to zoom on out. All right, and once again, folks, we are now looking down on our Milky Way galaxy. This is the galaxy that we live in. And can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> just kidding. And uh, just to let you know, folks, our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross it from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light. Whew, that is a great distance. And not only that, our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I do want to show you the shape of it from a sideways perspective. So when you look up in the night sky and people say, hey, look, that's the Milky Way, you're looking at the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. This is what you're seeing up in the night sky. And uh, when astronomers and scientists want to learn about the universe, it's so much more convenient and easier for them to point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south. Instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has planets, stars, gas, debris, nebula, things that block, that obscure their view of the universe. So keep that in mind. That's going to come important later on the show. We like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, er, uh, we're now going to see a view where every single point of light that you're seeing is no longer a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy. Each galaxy containing hundreds of bill billions, perhaps trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door, and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue zooming out, folks, uh, you're now going to notice that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to uh, create voids where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies at all. So we can see a nice galaxy cluster on the right-hand side over here. We can see another one not too far away over there. We can see some voids on the very top left of the screen over here where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies at all. So you can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together or they like to avoid each other. 
And folks, we've zoomed so far out now that this picture that we're looking at represents the closest 30,000 gal galaxies to us in space over 300 million light years across. And uh, we now have automated systems that are even mapping the most distant galaxies. So now we're about to see the very large scale structure of the universe. And remember folks, every single point of light that you're seeing, that's an individual galaxy, not a star. Whoa, I feel small. <laughs> and uh, just a heads up, our large scale structure of the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of our Milky Way galaxy? Well, our Milky Way galaxy would line up just like this, so right down the middle. And again, we point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way. But scientists still want to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane. So we have this nice purple survey of galaxies right over here. You can see that they were still able to find galaxies, just not as far and not as many. Pretty much we had to wait for the our technology to improve before we can fill, on, fill in these gaps that haven't been mapped out yet. So you can kind of think of all this stuff, but in every direction. So it's just a matter of time before we map it all out. But folks, it looks like we're running close out of time on our tour of the universe. 30 minutes is just not enough time to talk about the universe. So let's continue pressing on. And now we're going to be coming across these objects at the very edge of the large scale structure and these orange dots that are known as the quasars. So the quasars are going to be these orange points of light at the very edge right over there and on the right hand side. And the quasars are sure for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're about to see the very large scale, or the very edge of the observable universe. Alrighty, folks, so we've made it to the edge, and what we're looking at is something known as the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. And all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo either. Instead, what we're looking at is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, they gave rise to the large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Just figuring out how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, it looks like we've made it to the very edge, and this is as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go. That's going to be towards back uh, towards planet Earth. So let's make our return trip through all these nice quasars and galaxies, and let's make our return trip home, y'all. And just to let you know, folks, we're crossing an expanse of 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. 
but it looks like we just entered our Milky Way galaxy. We're making our way right to the radio sphere. And of course, we are making our way downtown, walking fast faces past when we're homebound. No, 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 no. And it looks like we just entered our planetary system, folks, passing those spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s. And we're making our final approach back to planet Earth. And we're now about to pass the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with us today. I hope you did enjoy it. But with that being said, that's all for now, folks. And again, thank you for stopping by.